This program brought to you by Toshiba, the biggest and brightest range of rear projection televisions, including the new multi-award winning 43-inch. This morning on National Nine Early News, Pete Sampras sets a tennis record and spoils Pat Rafter's Wimbledon dream. A deal signed to end the crisis in Fiji and Protestant marches in Northern Ireland go ahead without violence. This is National Nine Early News with Sharon Gadella. Good morning. Pete Sampras has won a record 13th Grand Slam title, defeating Pat Rafter in the men's final of Wimbledon. The American fought back after losing the first set in a tiebreak to make it back-to-back -back titles. Everybody, it seemed, was at Wimbledon for the men's final between Pat Rafter and Pete Sampras. But the fickle English weather upstaged them all, with play starting almost an hour late. It's going to be one of those days. Then, with Rafter and Sampras four games all in juice, the rain returns. We just hopefully can get the resumption of play pretty quickly. After two and a half hours indoors, they emerged. Rafter surviving four double faults to force a tiebreak. The Australian's desperation continued as the pair swapped set points. He's all right. Ironically, it was a Sampras double fault that handed Rafter the first set, 12-10 in a tiebreak. The second set also went to a tiebreak as Rafter continued to live on the edge. What athletic ability that was for Rafter. He raced to a 4-1 lead, but the defending champ reeled him in to take the tiebreak 7-5 and level the match. In the third set, Rafter covered so much court, he ended up on the wrong side of the net. No, he missed it. Right to Sampras. And look at he's given up. He's, oh, shoot. He then fell behind on the scoreboard as Sampras got the first break of the final to lead three games to two. The American then held serve to take a two sets to one lead. Boy, and what a way throws it out. Neither player gave an inch at the start of the fourth set. But in the fifth game, got Sampras it. broke oh, Rafter again. Missed it. Backhand goes in for a winner. Sampras broke Rafter again in the seventh game of the fourth set and then served That's for the championship. For time, Pete Sampras has done it. Pete Sampras with back-to-back -back victories at Wimbledon and a record 13 Grand Slam titles, breaking the previous record held by Australian Roy Emerson. Dave Carlson, National Nine News. Fiji coup leader George Spate has finally put pen to paper on a deal with the military to end the country's seven-week hostage crisis. Under the agreement, Spate and his supporters will be given immunity from prosecution, while it's promised the 27 hostages will be released on Thursday. <laughs> Only days ago, this seemed impossible. Hundreds of George Spate's followers marching from their parliament compound to witness an agreement that would end their country's crisis. And there in the middle, the man himself, savouring the moment. The people want to be part of it. They want to witness it. And so they made the uh, unanimous decision to march and to sing hymns, to come and show their support. The accord was signed by the military commander, Commodore Barney Marama, his country, he said, had been divided for too long, and now it was time to end the suffering. It is the beginning of a long journey as we chart our way forth for our beloved Fiji. For us to realise our dreams, we must be united. Then the signature of George Spate, which he says will guarantee the release of the remaining 27 hostages on Thursday. That's when the Great Council of Chiefs will meet to elect a new president. And then we shall make our way back to the mild parliamentary complex for uh, perhaps a bowl of grog and a little bit of celebration while we wait for Thursday. Spate says the accord will also spell the end of the recently sworn civilian government to be replaced by one chosen by the new president. George Spate calls this a victory for the people, but it's also a major win for the coup leader, who appears to have achieved all of his demands. After more than 50 days of turmoil, at last, Fiji has reason to hope. In Suva, Brad Smith, National Nine News. And Brad joins us now with the latest. Brad, does the signing of this accord represent victory for George Spate? 
It certainly does. This appears to be a total capitulation by the military. Last night, uh, the military commander, Commodore Baini Marama, appeared a crushed and, and broken man at the signing ceremony, while uh, George Spater looked extremely pleased with himself, and so he should. He has uh, uh, achieved, he's, he's received virtually everything he set out to achieve. Well, Brad, this crisis has come close to being resolved before. We've been told on a number of occasions the release of the hostages was imminent. How confident is everyone that this is the deal that won't unravel at the last minute? Well, as you say, they've come so close so often, but now an agreement has actually been signed and both sides say there is no going back. The military has agreed to all of Spate's demands, including the, the decision to, to bring on this meeting of the Great Council of Chiefs, which it had resisted for so long, whereas Spate himself has, has had to back down as well. He wanted a president of his choosing. Now he's agreed to accept the decision of the Great Council of Chiefs. So both sides are saying this is, the, this is the deal, this is going to be the end of this crisis, this is the deal that will see the release of these hostages. Brad, there were some question marks over the timing of the Chiefs meeting. Is it definite that it will be on Thursday? Yes, the, uh, the chairman of the Great Council of Chiefs, Sedevani Rambuka, had indicated uh, only a few days ago that it would be at least 10 days before he could call a meeting. Now the military has said, no, this is, this, this is dragged on for too long. The meeting will go ahead on Thursday, we're told. Spate uh, said yesterday at a press conference that uh, the hostages would be released before the Great Council of Chiefs meets. So uh, we can see, uh, look forward now, it seems, to these 27 remaining hostages, including the former Prime Minister Chowdhury, being released on Thursday. Well, let's hope so. Thank you very much for that, Brad. That was Brad Schmidt in Suva. Thanks, Sharon. The Prime Minister has finished his Federation visit to London. He dropped in on Australia's Federation Guard before leaving. He's now on his way to India, where he's keen to discuss Fiji's ethnic tensions. The natural interest of the Indian government in the position of Fijians of Indian heritage in that country. Mr Howard will also be keen to put the controversy of his visit to London behind him after he was strongly criticised for leaving the country after introducing the GST. The federal government is turning up the heat on Labor over Kim Beasley's promise to roll back the GST if elected. The opposition is refusing to give details of its plan until the next election, but the government is predicting it will create mountains of red tape for small business. One week on and both sides are continuing to snipe at each other over the GST. Small Business Minister Peter Reith warning that Labor's plans to roll back the tax will create bedlam. Instead of one set of changes, they're going to make progressive changes. That really is a red tape nightmare for the small business. The opposition claims the changes will be designed to simplify the GST. But Labor, which is still refusing to detail its plans, has signalled the tax will be substantially amended. It won't be just a few changes. We will announce the full detail of our rollback before the next election. It will be fully costed and funded. While the introduction of the GST may have gone more smoothly than many people expected, the opposition insists it's still early days, claiming the real test will come when companies lodge their first quarterly returns. Come October, when small business have to fill in those returns, they're going to find the problems they had implementing it over the last week uh, will pile into insignificance. Look, there are lots of issues and no one's understating them. It is a very big job for small business to make these changes. Mr Reith, meantime, says he will investigate claims of administrative problems with the government's petrol subsidy scheme in the bush. Laurie Wilson, National 9 News. Homicide squad detectives in Melbourne are investigating the deaths of a father and his two daughters. The bodies were discovered in the family's caravan after the man's girlfriend became worried when she was unable to contact them. The area around the caravan at the Bayside suburb of Williamtown has been sealed off. The man was in his 50s, his daughters aged 10 and 16. There is no indication at this stage of how they died. The inquest into the 1998 deaths of five volunteer firefighters begins today in Melbourne. Coroner Graham Johnston expects the inquest will hold hearings in the central Victorian town of Linton where the tragedy occurred. The five men, all from Geelong West, died when their truck was engulfed in flames. It's thought a sudden wind shift turned the flames back on the crew as they tried to shelter in the vehicle. 
Time now to take a look at the day's weather. And a slow moving low in the South Tasman Sea is directing a cool southerly wind flow over Tasmania and Victoria. A high is centred over South Australia. And it's looking pretty miserable for most capital cities today. Rain in Brisbane with a top of 21, 17 in Sydney with showers. A chilly 10 degrees in Canberra, showers in Melbourne and Hobart. An early shower in Adelaide heading for a maximum of 15. 18 in Perth with rainy periods, but there will be some sunshine in Darwin with 29 degrees. After the break on the early news, Protestant marches go ahead without any violence in Northern Ireland, but tensions still running high. And in sport, Valentino Rossi wins the British Motorcycle Grand Prix. The top stories this Monday morning, Pete Sampras has won Wimbledon, breaking Roy Emerson's Grand Slam record and ending Pat Rafter's Wimbledon dream. Fiji coup leader George Spate has signed an agreement to end the seven-week hostage crisis. It's expected all his captives will be released on Thursday. And the coronial inquiry into the 1998 deaths of five volunteer firefighters in Victoria gets underway today. Rail authorities have cleared the tracks at Bankstown in Sydney's west following yesterday's train derailment, the 28th in New South Wales in the past 12 months. It's believed the driver of the train went through a red light. Three of the train's four carriages were bumped off the line by an automatic safety mechanism. About 250 passengers were on board the train. No one was injured. An investigation into the incident is underway. 500 coal miners in the New South Wales Hunter Valley have begun a 24-hour strike as part of an international industrial campaign against mining giant Rio Tinto. Workers at three of the company's operations walked off the job at midnight. Their union claims it's over the company's failure to reach a collective agreement with its workforce. The strike coincides with protests around the world as part of a global week of action against the company. The Hunter Valley workers will attend a rally in the town of Singleton this morning. Charlie Dempsey, the man who caused a stir in international soccer by effectively handing the 2006 World Cup to Germany, has resigned as the Oceania delegate to FIFA, the sport's governing body. His resignation will take effect in September. Already, Soccer Australia chief Basil Scarcella has indicated he'll nominate for the vacancy. Still showing signs of the intolerable strain he says he's been suffering, 79-year-old Charles Dempsey had to face the wrath of his own committee today. At the headquarters of the Oceania Confederation in New Zealand, he explained why he defied their instructions to cast his vote for South Africa to host the World Cup. He then emerged to announce his resignation, which will take effect in September. The executive met and discussed. I wasn't present and gave approval to the explanations that I gave for what took place in Zurich. Committee members said that if he hadn't resigned, he'd have been sacked. He was uh, intelligent to say that, uh, to ask the executive to accept his uh, stepping down. So he jumped before he was pushed? Yes. And the winner, Deutschland. Germany's surprise win and Mr. Dempsey's subsequent complaints of harassment prompted allegations of intimidation and bribery. But a fellow FIFA delegate today told ITN there was nothing underhand. I don't believe that anybody was bribed, but I believe that there's a lot of pressure. I mean, listen, when Nelson Mandela calls your room as he did to Charlie, you know, Charlie may feel that that's a lot of pressure. You know, if Nelson Mandela called my room, I'd think it was a wonderful thing. Mr. Dempsey says he'll explain tomorrow why he refused to back South Africa. The controversial Drum Cree parade in Northern Ireland has gone ahead without violence. Hundreds of orange men were prevented from marching into a hostile Catholic area, stopping peacefully at a huge barrier erected by security forces. But Orange Order leaders have called for more protests. For the third year in a row, Portadown's orange men were stopped in their tracks at Drum Cree. The equipment of the battlefield is being used to prevent them marching through a nationalist area. They walked right up to the army's barricade anyway. This display of defiance in the face of the insurmountable has become an annual tradition. The only thing that's stopping us praying on Jabahi Road is that metal barrier. But we're given notice to the Secretary of State today is that as soon as that metal barrier is removed, Portadown District will pray the Jabahi Road. Only part of the path they wish to tread is denied them and thousands were involved in the march to Drum Cree. En route, they passed a Catholic estate. Ulster's two tribes could view each other across a barbed wire fence. 
Today has been incident free, but Portadown's Orangemen have called for province wide protests tomorrow, and the strength of those will indicate just how much support they have across Northern Ireland for the stand they have taken here at Drum Creek. The car bomb set off 15 miles away in the village of Stewartstown was probably the work of Republican dissidents, the real IRA. Today, Education Minister Martin McGuinness inspected the damage. Once a supporter of such attacks by the provisional IRA, he was critical of the Republican renegades. The people who were uh, responsible for this bomb have uh, no credibility whatsoever. They're opposed to the peace process. In my opinion, they're living in the past. The bombing is being seen as a deliberate attempt to heighten tensions still further at this difficult time. Coming up in the early news, a plane crash in Colombia claims at least 12 lives.